Kantorovich, he's a professor at King's College London. He works on many, many things, and he'll talk to you. It's probably quite a good continuation from what I talked about last week. Uh, he's probably kindly at the last minute stepped in for this uh, talk, so uh, enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Hello, Hello guys. You. So uh, that's the lecture I gave. We have yeah, King's uh, uh, um, uh, kind of um, Maxwell lectures given every Monday to students by different people from the college and outside. And this is a lecture I gave in 2003, a long time ago. <coughs> so because I didn't have time to prepare anything new, I wanted to prepare something new, but I was told that was a good lecture, let, let's just give it. So it's about a very old work I did uh, with some people and uh, it starts from an introduction, which I hope you will like. Um, so um, if you look at this picture, which my daughter helped me to do, you can see through the lens little kind of balls there. Yeah, you can just see them, this kind of atoms. So the question I'm asking is whether you can take a lens and look and see atoms with that lens, yeah? So from last week, you probably know the answer. It is possible, is it? Yeah, at least with AFM. Uh, but uh, 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 let me start just from far away and from the optical microscope. So the optical microscope, you have a wavelength of light. And with this, you can see something yeah, on, an, on a micro scale. Um, and these are already 15 years back, more than by that time microscopes. Yes, you see, connected to a computer. Uh, you don't need really to, to look into the, um, uh, with your uh, naked eye, you see an image on the screen, and this, uh, maybe I'm not uh, standing on the right, uh, but there's nothing I can do. So these are two images you have of a ceramic buzzer um, uh, with a 200 magnification, 2000 times magnification. So you can see something, but it's not atoms, you can see, right? So with the electron microscope, you can do much, much better now. Uh, so you have, uh, so that was 15 years ago, 200 sound magnification. Today you can have much more, actually. With electron microscope, as far as I know, you can actually see some details at the nanoscale today. Um, it's a big machine. The wavelength of electrons should be very small, the size of, of the atomic kind of dimensions. So that means a very large energy of the uh, incoming electrons. And with this you can see some detail, starting from uh, small scale to large scale. So what do you think this is? Any idea? No? Anybody would venture into suggesting something? Maybe on YouTube? No? Should I press a button? It's only 35 times magnification. This is paper, real paper. And you can see the paper, it's very rough. Um, this is 75 Black Widow Spider Claw. It's out of the other world, right? And uh, rice leaf, again, you can see some details. 750 times uh, uh, magnification. Uh, moth scales. See, so we have some structure. Um, I think I don't have a picture with 200,000 times. At that time, I wasn't able to find it on the web. I'm sure now it exists somewhere. So the question we're asking, whether it's possible to see actually atoms, which are much, much smaller objects, right? Um, uh, have you heard of scanning time in microscopy? Mm -hmm. So what do you know about scanning time in microscopy? You well, just heard about it? More. Or, uh, so yeah. I have a little kind of animation uh, with this. So it's based on, on what kind of effect? Based. What physical effect is based on? Tunneling. Tunneling. What does it mean, tunneling? So they can travel through the gap. Through the gap. So you have a potential going like that, and you have an electron coming through with the energy which is higher than the height of the potential. In the classical physics, the electron would fly through, right? Mm -hmm. and in quantum, but in classical physics, if the energy of the electron is lower than the height of the barrier, it will bounce off and go back. Yeah? This is what will happen. But in quantum mechanics, there is some probability to see a, an amplitude of an electron, which is a wave and a particle at the same time, on the other side of the barrier. 
So with some probability, depending on the energy of the electron, the closer the electron energy to the top of the barrier, the higher the probability will be. And the higher the temperature, the also you, you will see a higher kind of influx of electrons over the, uh, through the barrier. Yeah? Um, so that's tunneling. And that's because the electrons are wave particles with a wave function. A wave function may have tails through the barrier. And that's why you see this. So if you have two surfaces, so this is meant to be one surface and this is another surface. Of course, I can't draw an infinite number of atoms on both sides, but you can imagine these two semi-infinite surfaces. And if we connect them with the, with the battery, you will see zero current. If the distance between these two surfaces is too small. However, when you start um, bringing them together uh, at the distances of the order of 10 angstroms and, and less, you will find that there is a very small picoampere current flowing through this system. A very small current, still perfectly measurable. This is the tunneling. And the reason for that is, again, I didn't prepare anything, but I'll try to... Uh, there's no way I can draw. Or I can draw here. The wall. Yes, the wall. The wall. The wall. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, yes. You yes, yes. can draw anywhere as long as you don't stretch too high. Uh, I can hide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I suppose. Um, so, when you have a crystal... So, this is one surface. So, let's imagine we have positive ions here. And electrons would live in such a potential, which is singular at the ions, because it's positive electrons are negative charges, yes, yeah? so there will be an infinite energy when an infinite negative energy when the electrons are very close to the, to the ions. But in between there will be something. There will be something like that. That's a periodic solid. However, if we terminate that solid here, so there will be a surface in that direction. Yes, yeah? so this going inside. We have many, many layers of atoms going both ways, yeah, parallel to the surface. That that potential goes like that. Yeah? So it goes like that. At, at, at far away, there would be a zero potential created by the solid. So if you, uh, if you have electrons, electrons, they leave here somewhere. Yeah? Yeah, the cloud of electrons in the metal. Mm -hmm. They leave here, and they would need, depending on the energy, to overcome that kind of barrier to, to, to be um, uh, emitted from, 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 the, from the solid. Yes, yeah? so you can do it by, by uh, temperature. You can heat up the solid, so there would be some fluctuation of electronic density there, and the electrons would have some kinetic energy to overcome that barrier. And this is how you can see uh, electrons coming out of, of, of uh, say, an uh, electronic device which is heated up. And you know, the old lamps. Uh, you, you can also shine a light on this, so give this uh, energy, photon energy to the electrons, so they can overcome the barrier and fly away. You can, in fact, create, uh, give electrons much bigger energy than the, this, this height, and then the electrons would fly away with some kinetic energy, which of course is the difference. So this is one surface. If you have another surface like this here, so let's call this surface, and this is tip, yeah? So it's another surface. The tip is the, is, is, is a part of that device, that other surface which I have, say, on the right here in the picture. We will come to this. It will be exactly the same picture, so you have potentials like that, but on the surface, there will be something like that, yeah? So electrons of the surface would live here, and this creates, uh, uh, creates a natural potential world for them to live in. Some will escape, but it's probability very low, depending on the temperature. And the, the same here, there will be electrons here, and they will be living here. And you see, that thing here would be the barrier. So if these two surfaces are far away, you have the largest barriers to overcome for them. But now, let's imagine that thing is brought in here, closer, closer to the surface. At some point, you will have a very small barrier to overcome. Yes? And also, in this case, not the height of the barrier matters, but rather, but the width. Yeah? Because the width is what turns basically the, 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 the current, the, the probability for like this to go to tunnel through it. Yeah? So it's basically, it's very roughly the physics behind this device. And, of course, you know that there was a Nobel Prize uh, given to Binning and Orha, who developed this device in 1982. And from here it's clear that the current would decay very quickly as you separate these, these two surfaces from each other. And in fact, 
is very well described by the exponential function. Here z is the distance between these two surfaces. Yeah? So that's basically the idea of the device. And this is a, a groundbreaking uh, milestone of STM. It's so called silicon 111 surface. It's a very complicated surface. And as far as I know, uh, there's been a very long debate lasting for like 20 years what is the structure of the surface is. In only uh, within the event of STM, it was possible actually to pinpoint and discover, say exactly what the structure is. I have a very kind of uh, 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 not really good picture because you really need to see it in 3D but these different colors on atoms mean different height with respect to, to, to each other yes uh, there are some other atoms these red balls which are protruding really high and the greens here but slightly different because the two sides of this rhombus are slightly different and some other atoms and you have some vacancies here kind of real hole. And uh, uh, this is the STM image of that surface. We'll come to, to how this actually uh, come, come about, that image. But you can just see this structure. Look, this is the right hand side, the one here, yeah? The hexagon. So you can, you can guess that there's a rhombus here, it's shown here, but there's another one like this, between these four uh, vacancy sides, mm -hmm. yeah? You can only see other atoms. You can only see this red and green on that picture. All other atoms are a bit lower and you can't see them. So that's a bit of deficiency of the, the technique. You can't see absolutely everything. But you can see this and you can see that what the kind of periodicity we're dealing with. This can be told by other methods as well. But you can't see this kind of arrangement with other methods. Uh, and the STM was pivotal in establishing the exact structure of that surface. And then calculations actually prove that without any doubt that this is the surface of that crystal. And why do you think atoms are arranged in, some, in, in such a kind of funny way? And why the unit cell is so big? The, the, the periodic unit is so big? Who can tell me? Do you have any clue? Mm -hmm. This is silicon. Silicon has two atoms in the periodic unit and the bulk. But here we seem to have huge, 72 atoms actually, on the surface. 72. So it's a 7 by 7 ex expansion. So, any idea why this happens? Mm -hmm. So, you have atoms in the bulk. Um, you have atoms in the bulk. Yeah? Yes. Many cells, which repeat itself. Two atoms in each. Yeah? Okay, so the, every atom interacts with any atom around it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what you do, you take uh, a knife, say, and you remove all the atoms above some particular atoms, right? These atoms are not interacting anymore with anything here, it's a vacuum. So what happens? Uh, they're not happy at all. And the silicon, when between atoms you have covalent bonds, each atom is connected to four other atoms in a kind of being in the center of a tetrahedron. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you cut some bonds here. So atoms are not happy at all. They have uh, unsaturated bonds. They want to create more bonds. And what they do, they combine with each other. They shift, they displace in such a way that reduce distances between them because the situation here is quite different from what it is in the bulk here, yeah? And they make bond bonds to reduce their energy. The energy of the system wants always be uh, lowest. And uh, what happens if before we had two atoms in the periodic unit, now we may have many more atoms. So these periodic units combine together in a much bigger cell, and that cell is then periodically repeated, yeah? From the theoretical point group uh, view, you can't break the periodic symmetry, it still stays there, but you, have, uh, you, you can break it partially, yeah? So you still have some periodicity remaining, but it's much larger, so the, the, uh, the symmetry is lowered, yeah? But it's still there. So, so we call it reconstruction. Not all every surface reconstructs in that way. 
atoms may just move up or down like this, but the periodic unit may still remain the same. But some surfaces do reconstruct in the sense that these unit cells combine together into one bigger kind of quantity or unity unit that which periodically being then repeated. Yeah. So this is a, a, a textbook example of a high reconstructed surface. All right, so how STM works? So we discussed that depending on the distance between the tip, which is one surface, and the, and the actual surface we are investigating, depending on that distance, the current changes exponentially. The thing is that uh, your tip may stay above an atom or between atoms. And the situation may be different in that case, yes? Because it's a tunneling, it's a quantum effect, so small distances do matter. So let's imagine my tip stands exactly above an atom. So this little hat, hat there, it's a representation of electronic density, which is sitting mostly above that atom. Yes, let's assume that. So in that case, we have some electronic density protruding out of that atom into the vacuum. Yeah? And it will decay with some distance. And that, that kind of exponential decay of the density will determine this alpha, basically, in this exponential function. Yes? So my current here, I, would exponentially decay, uh, depend on the z, will exponentially decay, yeah? So if we bring my t now down, I will have a bigger, bigger current, yes? I hope you like my animation, you see? <laughs> this took me some time to do, <laughs> right? So you see the current increase, have you noticed the arrow yeah. moving? Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, you may set up a certain target for the current, and the target for the current is, is, is like this. So you, your machine would like to keep that current. So what the machine would do? So after that current, the machine would start moving the tip down, 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 down. So the current is still lower, 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 higher. So it would up until it would establish exactly the same that height of the tip, which would deliver exactly that current. Okay. So now, if we now move the tip to a different position, say between two atoms, there's much less electronic density there, so it would decay into the distance much faster, into the vacuum much faster, and in that case, that curve would be much steeper. So if you want to move the tip exactly to the same target value, the tip will have to move closer to the surface. By closer, we mean probably one angstrom, maybe half an angstrom, it's a tiny, tiny distance. But with modern technology, with piezoelectrics, electrics which, which actually are devices which move the tip. This is perfectly feasible. So, you see, the distance at which the tip should come, or the height at which the tip should, should stay above the surface, depends where actually the tip is, laterally, above an atom or maybe between atoms. So that alpha here, you see, will be different, the exponent, in each case. So, uh, when you now scan a real surface, uh, what you do, you, you have two machines, but let's discuss the, the most uh, um, uh, 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 widespread regime when the current is kept constant during the scan. When the, the tip scans, it goes like this. It scans the surface in a kind of dead manner. So you would cover a certain area of the surface you choose. And they, they use the mouse or on the computer to actually indicate the area. Then all these things they do. So if we stand above an atom, you have to stay high up, yeah? Mm -hmm. If you go between atoms, you move closer, then again up, again. So you have a scan line. So the machine detects by how much the tip moved down, by how much it moved up, when it goes laterally. And that can be, uh, can be recorded, and, oops, uh, and you have actually on the computer a line like this. Then you can imagine when you move, so that you go like this along the surface, one skyline, then you move a little bit sideways and you go again, again, and each time you have this line. So you combine them together, you have two-dimensional image. The one we saw with the, with the silicon 111 surface you saw before, yeah? Mm -hmm. Where, as I said, you see, we saw atoms. Um, one important uh, ingredient of this machine is that that other surface, which we call T, must be really sharp. Imagine it would not be sharp, it would be blunt. So, for example, a, a two-dimensional surface, very blunt. When you move that thing around, it will be almost no change. 
you really need to have something really sharp, atomic sharp, in order to feel the difference between the positioning of the tip above an atom or between atoms. Mm -hmm. So that is essential. And that is a really something which uh, experimentalists cannot control, still cannot control really well. But with some trial and error, you can do this. So the first they create a protrusion on, on the surface of the cantilever. So you have a cantilever which actually moves. And, the, and here, at the, at the end of the cantilever, you have a piezoelectric. And you apply a wise, bias voltage on this piezoelectric, and that piezoelectric would move the tip by this little distance. Yeah, depending mm -hmm. on the voltage you apply. Uh, but you have to make at the end something really sharp. And they do it by bombarding the tip with argon ions, for instance, uh, or putting that tip in, in some kind of um, a, a solvent. And after that, you still can't guarantee that the tip is, is really atomically sharp. It may be sharper, especially in the solvent. It would, was like this, it would kind of start eating out this matter, it would become like this. But what is it then? It could be still macroscopically large entity. So what they do, they sometimes just crush the tip upon the surface. Maybe Mark told you about this. And this creates some atoms coming on the tip, or tip is losing some of the atoms. And they discard. And they do it many, many times until they see a nice image. And what they do, they try to keep the tip not crushing anymore and scan for some time, like a month or maybe one day. It depends. But these are images of some of the tips um, taken with another, uh, uh, another microscope, um, another kind of device. Uh, so these are real tips and you can see that the, then there's something sharp. All right, so I'll show you now uh, some uh, real things which we did with experiments in Nottingham. So this is a side view of so-called silicon 001 surface. So this the indices 001 means uh, a way in which you cut the surface. The, the, the crystal is three-dimensional, you can cut it that way, that way, that way. So there's a way to indicate which way you cut, yeah? So this is a very specific way you cut. Uh, uh, I need a pointer. Is there any pointer? No? Uh, I will use the mouse. No, no. Anyway, uh, so you can you can see here you have diamonds, two atoms at the top, bound together. This is also an example of reconstruction because if you cut the surface, this these atoms will apart. But once you remove this metal here, they decided to come together because that way they would uh, uh, establish a bond. There is still, still one bond unsaturated for these upper atoms, but that's not the point. The point we have these diamonds going like this, yeah, along the surface. So, um, so this is my surface, and also you can appreciate that these diamonds they form like rails, yeah. Between diamonds here you have a trough, this one and this one. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a big, big empty, empty space, yeah. But when the diamonds protrude, you have like a big uh, rails with some dangling bones standing that way slightly asymmetrically. And that would be quite reactive for some matter to come in. So that matter would be a C60 molecule, a bucket ball. Yeah, another, matter, uh, another um, 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 type of matter made of carbon. And if you combine them together, you put the molecule on top, and the molecule makes bonds with these dangling bonds of the carbon atoms. It's very, very stable. So the energy of such a um, uh, such a uh, such a soap molecule is between two and three electron volts, which is we consider as a significant energy. Now, what you can do with this? Okay, so you, if you drop these molecules in vacuum on that surface, because of the dangling bond, these bucket balls would stick somewhere in different places, like with the glue, and remain there because they are quite stable there. 2-3 electron volts, it's a lot of energy. But now imagine you will come with a tip. And uh, so this is my bucket ball. You come with a tip here. And you start moving the tip. You can move the bucket ball, right? So this is called manipulation. Yes? Huh? It's working. Thank you. Right. So this is called manipulation. So here, these are real STM images. They are taken in the following way. First of all, they, ca they came with the tip some distance away from the surface, not to touch this bucket ball, just to make a scan. You still have quite a few angstroms in, at, at your disposal. You don't need to come that low to scan the surface. 
Sometimes it's difficult to scan both uh, a molecule and the surface, but in this case they managed. And you can see that the two, this arrow is just drawn afterwards, so this is not the real image. So you have these two bucket balls here, yeah? And you can see this rose, this is silicon surface, this is silicon surface. And the diamonds run that way. This is diamonds that way, yeah? And you can even see a defect here, some atom is missing. So this can be used as a reference point yeah, for us, because in every image you see they're at the same position. All right? So now look, after they scan these bucket balls, what they do, they come with the tip lower, and they move the tip, say, I can't remember which direction, but let's suppose in that direction they move it. They move it for some distance, then they retract the tip, and scan the surface again. And after that, you have the second image here. You see that atom moved. You see defective sides in the same position. Everything is the same. That one is exactly the same position. Remember, with this, the, 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 the hole here, but that one moved. Now you do it again, you move it even further. So you really move the bucket ball <coughs> along the rails, because as I said, diamonds run in that direction, from the bottom to the top. Yeah. All right. You can also move bucket balls in the opposite direction, in the perpendicular direction, across rows, but that results in some distortion of the surface, which you can clearly see here. Something really so these diamonds, which are on the surface, they actually are quite flexible. They can buckle, and so by moving the tip, uh, by moving the C60 across, you induce this buckling, and you may even create some defects. So what that is, nobody knows, but this is what they see in the image, so maybe it's some kind of defect, maybe some other move. That also changed, you see, uh, yeah, no, it's not changed, but uh, okay, yeah? So you see some, something happening. But the, the probability of moving these bucket balls across uh, this, uh, the, the rails is much, much lower than along them. Um, and the question uh, which was kind of set up in, for, for us theoreticians is to understand what actually happening uh, when you move the C60 uh, along the rails. How the C60 is moving? It's like a football, yeah, C60. It consists of hexagons and pentagons. And the football, the, the ball, the way to, uh, to make the ball out of the fabric, or out of the leather, was actually uh, um, uh, discovered before the bucket ball structure was, was discovered. It's done exactly of hexagons and pentagons. And if you look at the C60, it's exactly the same structure, which I found fascinating. Yeah? Um, so this is a high resolution image of, 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 of another experiment, which, which sheds some light on this question. So, so you can see these three bucket balls before the experiment was conducted. So you make an image, then you come down, and you try to move this one. You can see this one as well at the edge of the image, yeah, somewhere. And then you scan again. And that one moved here. Now well, let's look carefully what we see. Do you see any substructure here? No? Do you see arches running that way, here arches running that way, here arches running that way, and here arches running that way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. These are not atoms. You can't resolve carbon atoms of C60. But at least you can see some substructure. And you see that atom, that molecule was moved from this position to this position. And the, the, the direction of these arches changed. What that might mean? That it's rolled. Yes, mm -hmm. it's rolled. It actually was not slided from one position to another, but it's actually rolled. Yeah? So that was an interesting observation, and we wanted to understand why this happens. So sliding or rolling, and it seems to be from the experimental point of view, it is the case. I don't have, I have, uh, because I said, there was very short notice, I don't have uh, uh, any, um, any, but we've done this, this work, we actually proven, using theory, and quite uh, expensive calculations, which at that time we ran for eight months. So we modeled, we took a tip, which was a molecule, like that. We placed the C60 on the surface, and then we moved the tip towards the 60, and we found that C60 actually rolled, like this. So the 60 stands on the surface on four legs, if you like, four 
covalent bonds it makes. But once you start pushing the 60, it breaks the, the rare bonds, starts pivoting on the front ones, until a new pair of bonds is established in front, again four. So initial final structure are different slightly, because the 60 is not just a spherical ball. It consists of hexagons and pentagons, and you can appreciate that if it stands up with a hexagon down, when it rolls, it might be pentagon down or something mm -hmm. like that. So it will be a different structure. But uh, and experimentalists went really far. They, 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 um, they actually. Okay, I, I can show this. They, they, uh, they rolled the 60 for a distance of about 100 angstroms. And then when they did, they did it with a constant current, a constant sorry height. Uh, because it's easier to do manipulation with constant height rather than constant current, as I showed before. And they see the current only was constant, constant current. Maybe it was a constant current, actually. Constant current. So then, as I said before, they record what the tip does, going up and down, up and down. And so they have kind of images going like this. Each time this is 60 is moved, the tip behind, it remains there, and the 60 moves, and it goes down because there's no matter underneath. So it goes up when the 60 kind of moves, then the 60 jump to the next position. The tip is not that fast. So it goes down until it comes again to the 60, climbs, then the 60 is moved. Yeah, mm -hmm. you understand, and goes down. So you have kind of a uh, sawtooth structure like this. But what they discovered, that the sawtooth structure is not as simple as this one. It has some, some little kind of wiggles here. And if you measure each of these wiggles, this is exactly dimer uh, uh, dimer distance along the road. So the idea was that, okay, it moves, but it moves in steps. And when you move, uh, look at the C60 structure with these hexagons and pentagons um, uh, changing when you roll, you can really appreciate that there are exactly four positions it has to, you have to uh, roll into in order to arrive exactly the same kind of orientation as it was at that point. So we, these wiggles, there were four of them, and we we'll explain it exactly like that. So, and you can see how this is rolling. So that was uh, something we did. Um, so this is how a theory can help to understand what experimentalists see. Yeah? So this is um, an example of a molecule, another molecule, a rather big one, uh, which also was manipulated. So this is the same image of that molecule. Uh, you see, it's the molecule is huge. You can't see really out of it, but you can see uh, some of the molecule. What actually you see, you can't say without doing a real calculation. But then, with some thought, you can see the the, the image. Uh, you, you can see, you, you can work out how the molecule is oriented on the surface and you see how the image looks like. And then you come with the tip and you push the molecule and what happens here, the molecule can rotate sometimes depending on where you stand with the tip. But here, the manipulation was made not by mechanical movement, by driving a very high current through a certain position of the tip. Uh, so the tip stood here and then Normally, when you image, you apply a very li little bias, yeah, maybe half a volt, maybe one volt. Here you apply a bias, I can't remember exactly the number, but much higher. Or you come much closer, you come much closer, the current will be much higher. And when you perturb the system like that, you see that something changes. The molecule rotates. That's kind of another example. Here, we have a molecule uh, the same, but the structure of that molecule is very funny. It's, it consists of a board of carbon carbon hydrogen board and we have four legs uh, like this so basically something like that and two legs here so four legs it's like a uh, uh, trolley something yeah. and you can change the position of that leg you can you can rotate it like this and this is what they call it. first of all they you can't put the tip above one molecule and strike a good current through it and what happens they Iodine atom, which is the weakest bound to, to that molecule, just separates out. Then you take a tip and pull it a little bit farther away from the molecule. So here you left behind C6H5. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, now imagine you have uh, two such molecules 
close to each other. So iodine atom was taken out of this one, was taken out of this one the same way. Then you come with the tip in between them, so you push them together a little bit, come with the tip, and then you shine again, you strike again a good current, yeah? And they fuse together. And you have a molecule C12H10. It's a single chemical reaction performed on the spot. Uh, so that's the idea. This is how it worked, really. So let's look at these pictures. Uh, so here you have two either benzene molecules. Uh, so first of all, you separate out. So all these experiments were done. Say you first take an image, you then you do closer, you come closer, you do manipulation, then you retract and take the image again at the, exactly the same spot. And then you do it as many times as you need to. Yeah? So we are looking at the images between these manipulations. So here, two complete molecules. Here, iodine atom was taken away. Now the second iodine atom was taken away. Then they were brought farther away from, from the core of the molecule. Then that one was removed to this terrace here. And then they, they moved this bit, so this one of these molecules, closer to this one, manipulated with it mechanically. And then they fused them together. And they created a single molecular reaction on the surface. Yeah? That's a very impressive experiment, actually. To my knowledge, no, nobody theoretically actually um, uh, uh, simulated this kind of experiment. So, to date, a number of such experiments were conducted. Um, this is just to show you a few, a few further STM images. This is a <coughs> molecule, guanine. Who knows what guanine is? It's a nucleotide. Nucleotide, yes. So the, the one of the four in the DNA, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can place them on the surface. Uh, so in this case, it was gold surface. If you, you place them, uh, they form hydrogen bonds with, with each other. And they form very beautiful structures. So you can see the structures like flower beds. So this is what they do. Yeah. You can't resolve the molecules, uh, the, the atoms in the molecules, but you can resolve the molecules. Manuel has done a lot of work on this. <laughs> Uh, uh, guanine, another nucleotide, also forms similar structure in a way. Yeah. So you see, the molecule, each molecule is just a bulb. Sometimes you can resolve, sometimes you can't. Um, so this was STM. Now we have a little bit of AFM. How much time do I still have? Five minutes. Five minutes. All right. So this is AFM. It was discussed with you already. So this is the tip of slating. This time above the surface you have to make it oscillate you don't have current anymore, you have just mechanical force and depending on the distance of the tip with the surface you have a change of the resonance frequency and you can record that resonance frequency when you stay above an atom or between atoms it's the same idea you have some corrugation, some difference as you scan the surface with this oscillating tip and uh, this is that silicon 111 surface you can compare the one taken uh, with AFM and STM, they almost the same. Yeah, it shows exactly the same kind of signature. And you can see even defects the same. You see so here one, here something. But and this another one. But it's slightly different because it's a different type of uh, of, of interaction. Uh, theoretical modeling, I can probably skip. But basically, when you theoretically uh, study this system. You, you solve this kind of equation. This is an equation of the forced harmonic oscillator. So this is a, uh, this is a resonance frequency of the of the cantilever oscillating. This is an excitation signal which is applied on the piezo which holds the, the cantilever and make it to oscillate. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, sinusoidal force. And this is a force from the surface, which exponentially decays into the vacuum, similar to the current decaying. And uh, this is a friction, you see, gamma velocity of the tip. This is a friction which is also present in the system. So by studying basically that equation you can you can uh, you can study how the AFM works. Uh, but I, I won't, don't want to go into too much. I'll show, want to show you because there's not much time. I will show you only a movie. I have a very nice movie. Um, 
This movie was made in a group of Ivan Stich in Bratislava. So this is they play it around, so they can you can see how the oscillating tip approaches the surface and retracts, and how the electronic density of the whole system changes. This clouds this electronic density, and um, that's the film they prepared. Yes. So the calculation starts from the slab. This is kind of a piece of, of a surface which we model. Then that ah, there's no sound. There must be sound. Wait, wait. Wait, wait. Without sound, it doesn't work. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Somebody I don't speak that language. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Wait, let's, let's take this down. Um, right. Okay. We don't want to see all the experience. Um, okay. Uh, right. Here we go. Slab, which we use to simulate. This is part of the surface, the upper layer. These are the tips. And we have tips with different atoms at the end. Mark, did you see this movie? So you see, and and the attractive interaction, so the tip and the surface, they attract each other, all in love in a sense. Then you have force distance curves, yeah? And they have an attraction, they're negative. But it's not always the case, sometimes we don't like each other. Still kissing. is repulsive. So it's another apex atom at the end of the tip. So this is how electronic density looks like when the tip comes very close. There's some redistribution of charge. And you see, depending on where you stand on the surface, at some side you have repulsion, some attraction. And that is the, 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 the idea of the corrugation you observe in the, in the machine. Alright, so that's how this works. So the important point is that theoreticians work alongside experimentalists. Neither of the sides can work separately. We have to work together, otherwise we can't really explain anything. Because what you see in experiment is just images, they don't know what it is. They can't tell whether this, this block is an atom or maybe some space between atoms, they can't tell that. And sometimes they can't even resolve atoms. Yeah? So only theory uh, can do this, but theory is also limited because we don't really know what the tip structure is. We need to know what atoms at the end of the tip at least or what maybe secondary atoms above that apex atom would also contribute to the, to the actual image, so we don't know that. So we have to run many, many simulations with different structures of the tip and see which ones um, reproduce the images um, created by experimenters, yeah, measured by experimenters. Okay, I hope that was useful. Yes, yes. Okay.
from time to time, yes. It's not always the same. But, yeah. we, we've done work on um, imaging. People still do imaging uh, because it's important. Uh, but more exciting is uh, to study manipulation, which I described with C60, but it's also people do manipulation with more complicated, more, more complicated kind of um, type of manipulations. Uh, although they look sim simpler, so if you consider manipulation of an atom, for example, as compared to C60, it looks like C60 is more complicated than that. Actually, it's the other way around. C60 is a kind of a big object which you can't really break, but atom is something <coughs> which interacts with the surface much stronger. You have some, some issues with this. So we started, for instance, on a um, oxygen terminated kappa surface manipulation of, of, of a so-called super kappa atom which is kappa atom standing in a specific position on the surface and uh, experimentally it was found that not always this kappa atom can be manipulated and in fact it uh, jumps on the tip rather, than, uh, rather from, than from one position on the surface to another position on the surface which I presented you can also take atoms or even molecules on the tip or from the tip, you can drop something on the surface. And we've done also one one very interesting paper on on this C60, uh, which I can probably explain. Okay. Um, when you have a molecule C60 molecule on the surface, as I said, it stands on four legs. And when you come with the tip, uh, and you want to vertically manipulate that molecule, you need to establish a very strong interaction with the molecule to take it away from the surface. Because they have to break these four bonds. This is very difficult to do. So, uh, what uh, Natalia Matsimovic actually discovered, <coughs> wife of that guy over there, so she, she came up with a very interesting idea. What if we first manipulate that molecule into the pivoting position? So, we will put it only on two legs. The pivoting, remember I was explaining the pivoting, yes? You break two rare bonds, this two, and the molecule would stand on this two. And that, if you come with the tip, you can try to keep the tip above the molecule. In that case, the, the bonding of the molecule with the surface is much weaker. And at that point, you can actually leave the molecule with the tip. And that was demonstrated. Yeah, we found the tip, we did the job. So, by pivoting the molecule halfway through and then lifting, that works, yes? Mm -hmm. So, we can pick the, up the molecule and then move the tip to another position and drop it. But again, if you drop it on the surface like this, it will be in that position. So, you want to remove the tip and keep the molecule on the surface, but the tip will take the molecule with it, right? You have to roll it back. You roll it again, yeah, you roll it back. You roll it back with the tip until have two, four bonds, and then you move the tip. So that's a mechanism of vertical manipulation of the molecule. Yeah. So something like that we, we did uh, with this copper atom, which I explained that that was a very dynamical kind of work. So we, we looked at time dependence of the manipulation itself. So how uh, this was stochastic because not every time you uh, you um, so basically the tip also it's AFM manipulation this time tip oscillated and there is a probability of the atom jumping on the tip um, and uh, it happens not at, at the very first oscillation but it happens stochastically at the nth oscillation and for, for every oscillation there is a certain probability you can assign to it at which it happens and you can calculate uh, nicely uh, what is the probability of manipulating this atom this is what we've done, so this kind of stuff yeah? Uh, but we do it a more of different other things, completely unrelated to this, but yeah, that's, uh, that would take all that. So okay, yeah. Thank you for the fantastic lecture, that I really enjoyed it. Can <laughs> uh, we share of the speaker with the students, please, for our uh, physics blog, if you don't mind?